Еще раз добрый день. Okay. Good afternoon once again. So we are happy to greet you here as participants of the second session of the Moscow Futurological Congress. I'm uh, Oleg Nikiforov representing uh, Interwork uh, Project, one of the co-organizers. Uh, also, uh, please uh, see Mr. Wolf from uh, Goethe Institute Moscow, uh, who are our partners and who are an essential link in this project. Uh, Wolf, take the floor, please. Working language has um, been English all um, throughout the Congress. Um, has everybody got a the earphones, um, well, if not, you can get them from over there, and I hope that um, everything is working. Is that true? All right, well, I don't see any resistance from your part, so I think um, everything should be fine. Um, thanks uh, very much for your interest in um, our Futurological Congress. In fact, it's the second one. Mm. Well, the first one we um, organized in um, December 2002, uh, 2012, sorry, um, uh, together with AliEx. Uh, Ali so um, it's almost like a, um, yeah, uh, like a very, very nice and pleasant um, uh, <coughs> repetition. Um, well, we. It, uh, I don't want to take long in, um, in introducing, um, uh, well, the, uh, introducing the theme. Um, let me just, um, first of all, um, uh, introduce our great guests who have been um, taking part in uh, this uh, Congress for the last two days. Um, I'll start um, from my right, your left. Um, this is Raisa Balimbaraj, sociologist. Um, David Zubrecki um, from Hungary, blogger, urbanist. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Sasha um, Bronikov, psychoanalytic from Moscow. Uh, Sofia Schönborn, uh, Schönborn from Essen, sociologist um, with, well, with a focus on um, also on climate, intergenerational justice. Well. In any case, um, she'll, she'll tell you about it. Uh, <clears throat> Sönke Kreft from um, uh, the German NGO, um, German Watch, an um, NGO focusing on the climate. Uh, then Hannah Prinzler, um, documentary filmmaker. Um, she's recently done um, a film on international patent law. Then to my uh, left, Olga Sedakova, who I do not need to introduce any further. Um, I guess you all know her very well. Um, and then um, next to um, <coughs> Olga Sedakova, that's Christopher Dell, whom some of you might know uh, already because um, earlier on, um, <coughs> in fact, well, not six months ago, he played a great concert, um, a jazz concert, because in fact he's a jazz musician, a vibraphonist, um, uh, and I love him <laughs> at that, but he's also an urbanist, um, and we invited him to the Congress in, in that particular function at uh, this time. So, well, actually, um, it's very sad that you didn't play a concert. <laughs> uh, anyway, next to um, Christopher is um, <coughs> Constanze Kurz. She's the general secretary of um, the German um, hackers um, association called Chaos Computer Club. Um, well, next to other things, but um, I'll leave it at that. Well, even though um, to the Congress, we invited her um, as the author of a book on uh, automization, automization in a modern day's world and how, um, how uh, machines, uh, well, um, tend to replace uh, human beings in our uh, modern working world. Sergei Krotov, next to um, Constanze, professor of uh, theoretical physics um, here in Moscow. Thank you very much for being here. Um, Justin Smith, um, well, um, 
I don't, well, he's, he's coming from various countries and speaking all kinds of languages, as we learned. Uh, but in any case, well, I'll, um, I'll uh, confine myself to saying that he's now based in Paris um, and teaching their philosophy. Um, Lena Petrovskaya, um, <coughs> uh, sitting next to um, Justin, uh, a philosopher uh, whom you probably all know. Um, uh, Alek Aranson next to Lena, thanks for being here. Uh, <coughs> next to Alek is um, Halid, Halid Unver. Um, he's um, working, um, uh, he's based in Ulm at the faculty of, um, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, but he's already, uh, he's um, by education, he's an engineer, but now, um, uh, he, well, his professor uh, um, and um, his team, um, and uh, Halid being one of them, is uh, working on an, uh, well, a particular economic model, uh, namely the uh, well, a socio-environmental um, economic model that um, could or should um, uh, be implemented into the world. Um, and uh, next to uh, um, Halit um, is Wojtek, um, our uh, great Polish guest um, uh, from uh, um, Wojtek Alitski, sorry for, um, <laughs> for leaving out <laughs> surname. Uh, Wojtek, um, uh, he's an expert on Stanislav Lem, um, who uh, really, um, whose book really, um, well, gave the um, well, uh, <clears throat> gave the clue to our, the title of our um, event, namely the Futurological Congress. It's a great book. Um, uh, um, <coughs> Wojtek um, told us about um, the various ideas of Stanislav Lem that um, are still um, current or, um, and today and um, make sense today or don't make sense today. Thanks for being here. So, that's all. Uh, on top of that, we have two participants of uh, the first uh, Futurological Congress. Uh, Alexander Antonovsky, please raise your head, uh, a sociologist, and Andrei Roding, a philosopher and a mathematician. So you probably noticed that in our very uh, diverse team, you don't see any futurologists, and you shouldn't be confused by that. Uh, we weren't confused either, because the idea was to host a futurological uh, congress without a, futurolo a futurologist, because uh, we asked candidates of the past and the present conference to be based on their knowledge and their experience to um, reflect on, uh, to review the question how the future uh, will um, unveil in their particular field. Uh, what is the potential for the future, for the upcoming? And uh, questions were worded in different ways, so we were given some attempts uh, to answer the question during the first two days of the conference. So to start uh, our conference, we asked our panelists uh, to develop the main ideas or statements they delivered uh, uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday. So, and we would probably ask them uh, to start with summaries in the chronological order. So let's start with Wojciech. Um, um, start um, uh, really um, deeply felt thanks to um, the Gogol Center. Um, we, we had a great time here and sp specifically here. Um, it's, uh, it's a really great place and a really great place for a Futurological Congress. So. <laughs> Um, uh, thanks very much. Well, um, uh, <coughs> Alexei Malabrotsky is sitting um, over there um, from the Gogol Center. Um, thanks very much for your hospitality. And um, apart from that, um, uh, last but not least, um, uh, apart from Latera Org and the Goethe Institute, um, there were two more cultural centers involved in it, namely the Hungarian Cultural Center and the Polish Cultural Center. Um, 
great friends of ours and great um, comrades in, in action, let's say like that. Thanks very much. Wojtek, please. Uh. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand a little bit of Russian, but I don't believe you would like to hear me uh, speaking in Russian. So sorry for having to speak in English. Introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, I was invited here uh, to, to as a kind of that's that's how I saw my, my role here as a, as a spokesperson for for, for the late uh, Stanislaw Lem, a great Polish writer who. It's, it's his 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 life and 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 work was was very much uh, related to to, to, to to his Russian Russian readers. The the last the last up to the to this point that his very last uh, thing that he ever wrote just literally on his deathbed it was actually told to his secretary and and then uh, and then went went to, to to his weekly. It was a column which was uh, basically an answer to, to to questions asked by Russian readers on on a, on a popular then portal. Inosmi.ru. So that was the very last thing he ever wrote, and died uh, in the next day. So, 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 so really, he, he was a person for whom his uh, Russian readers were, you know, in, important enough that okay, so I have to die, but maybe before I do, I, I just answer this question. Oh, so now I'm free. Goodbye. So that, that was basically the, his last last couple of days uh, in the hospital. So, uh, I, I, if if my if my if my jokes seems, seems a little bit uh, bitter, and I, I hope it's 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 uh, consistent with a very dark note of humor uh, in, in in most of them works, including. Uh, uh, humorist uh, novelette, sorry, sorry, <laughs> including the novelette Futurological Congress. Uh, our Congress didn't look at all like the Futurological Congress in this book because, you know, the building is still standing, so. But we still have two hours to, to demolish it, so who knows. But, 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 but anyway, um, I think, I think, uh, Lem, uh, he, of course, he wrote about the future. He often joked about the future, but he was also trying sometimes to, to predict it, not as a scientist, because he wasn't as a scientist, but as, as a thinker, as, as, as a philosopher. And uh, so, so, some of the ideas we were discussing here, like the, like the question of artificial intelligence, uh, were also asked, uh, asked in, his, in his novels and in his essays. And uh, he, he, he basically said in his, in his uh, most important essay, uh, Summa Technologia from 1960, for uh, that probably maybe not his generation but the next generation like like mine will have to answer those questions which were so far reserved for science fiction writers like what is a human being and therefore who is entitled to have human rights is it that simple that this is human this is machine maybe it still is but soon it won't be anymore uh, or another question of transhumanism, like if we'll improve our bodies, or maybe not our bodies, but bodies of next generation, will there be still human beings? And so, 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 so these are the questions which even today, if you ask them, you might sound crazy to, to somebody, but actually this is the last moment to, to still ask them theoretically because probably yeah, they are already a practical issue somewhere else in some laboratory. So that was basically my point of view. And often when somebody mentioned uh, any topic, I sometimes said about a science fiction story or novel by, by, by Lem, which was dealing with a similar topic, like, uh, for instance, The Dark Side of the Moon, even that was present in one Lem's story. So that was it. Thank you. All right. Next one, uh, Constanze Kurz. While we go from well, the way we went. Um. Well, yes, um, I am a um, hacker and technologist, so my view on the, on the world is, of course, a technologist's one. And I uh, did a expedition through some, some, in some countries of Europe to see what the production processes are like today. And how the robotization, computerization, and digitization really works in our day-to-day uh, -day businesses, but also in the working field. And these are the questions I addressed. So uh, to answer the questions like, uh, what kind of work, not only manual work, but also cognitive work, um, will be done in the future and in the upcoming? Uh, still from, from humans themselves, and what, what part will be done by machines only. And not only robots, but of course software too. These are the questions which I addressed. And 
you're speaking of the cooperation between man and machine and the symbiosis actually that happens. There are some pressing questions with, which we have to answer, um, namely, what should our children learn and study today? What, what parts, what tasks, and what professions will be safe from automation? And which are the realms in which we, as human beings, work in the future? And which will be maybe safe for now and for the next decade? That is really what I'm asking myself. And of course, since I'm a technologist, um, I think that it's useful for all of us that machines do work for us. But of course, it's a question of decision making and um, the question of uh, how we design and structure our society when we work day by on a daily basis, uh, side by side with machines, and, and not only in a in the sense of robots, but also software products in the end. Yeah, that were the questions which I tried to answer, and uh, there are not many parts left that I think cannot be done by a machine now and in the near future. That's, I have to rhythm me. Okay. Hello. Uh, I was delivering a presentation as a psychoanalyst, not as a scientist, and I was happy that one scientist, a theoretical uh, physicist, uh, heard my ideas, which was an important outcome of that uh, meeting. So uh, that uh, I realized that actually physicists can uh, understand uh, psychoanalysts. And uh, I'm Alexander Bronikov, a psychoanalyst, by the way. So I was uh, speaking about the side effects of the science to the subjectivity of the human being and what uh, practi uh, practicing psychoanalysts uh, see in their working life. And also I covered the one aspect studied by psychoanalysts, uh, which is error or a miss or slip of the tongue, some miss uh, which could be related to speech or could occur at the moment of time when we deal with certain machines and this object it was intense on intention that I covered uh, that uh, Lacan followers in uh, psychoanalysis focus on topology and also we talk a little bit about the theory of knots and how this theory of knots uh, could be used for interpreting uh, slip of the tongue by Freud. We also could discuss Möbius trip and uh, as applied to the nod. So um, I gave the audience uh, a couple of uh, thoughts and the news that uh, uh, psychoanalysts uh, learn topology. Uh, but the thirds were that uh, psychoanalysis has a different mode of study with some details that uh, science uh, can have some side effects. So that's it. Uh, Sergey Krohov, please. Uh, so our moderator introduced me. I'm a theoretical physicist. I work for the Moscow State University with the Department of Physics. So I thought my uh, attendance would be a uh, complete nonsense when the idea uh, occurred. Uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, I've been in close contact with uh, students, uh, young professors uh, for about 30 years, and I uh, never started a conversation on future. But uh, uh, if we would uh, look uh, back or ahead, I realized that uh, all bits of science which are exciting to me are actually mastering future, uh, bold how it may sound, because if we look at the establishment of physics, including uh, theoretical physics, 
um, we can really see that theoretical physics goes along with mathematics, but it uh, uh, takes uh, the job uh, to take out some new images and concepts, some fantastic uh, constructions, and then in a certain way it projects them to some uh, phenomena which uh, are not uh, understood and uh, uh, translates them into the reality. And the most striking example would be a field which used to uh, appear as something abstract to Faraday, for instance, in, in 19th century. And without describing the classical physics of Galileo or uh, Descartes and Newton, maybe the turning point was the beginning of the 20th century when quantum mechanics was uh, invented or devised. Um, quantum mechanics and quantum theory, the theory of relativity. So what was seen as multidimensional in mathematics, physicists were and uh, natural scientists were happy to live uh, in the river of time. Well, sometimes, of course, we uh, take a look at what's going on and try to uh, become part of the current, but we cannot alter it in this or that way. We are not participating in the speed of movement. So the quantum mechanics uh, in the theory of relativity was where some unbelievable facts were revealed that depending on the observer and uh, his insight, some events could be simultaneous or not, and uh, their venue and time could be quite different. Absolutely because they are showing what uh, exists in uh, our reality and it depends on where from you are looking at it and the world of uh, elementary particles as the construction of the whole world uh, it uh, changed completely because we uh, saw this uh, multitude of strange transformations uh, which uh, after with we, we, we saw in our time in 10 years in some more year we saw the world of elementary particles where we needed to uh, re uh, find the relationship between all the uh, things that we wish were happening there and we thought about 10 uh, dimension or 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions and uh, on the one hand it seems like an abstraction which is uh, no rational at all but if we uh, think it if you see it from the point of uh, view of different formulas it uh, turns out to be a very productive and effective Effective idea, and uh, there is a very interesting absolute paradox. Two weeks before this uh, congress, I read an article uh, which uh, interested me a lot, and uh, it was uh, it had a very uh, strong name, even an obscene name. Uh, it was saying that our time was a time of scientific counter-revolution, if you wish, but. It was saying that the science wasn't uh, giving new uh, nutrition to our brain, but if we see the science in the 18th century, 19th century, its development, its uh, uh, objectives, they were rational, they were understandable, but the uh, further it goes, the more evident, the more patent is uh, this uh, divergence, this crisis of uh, science, this revolution of science, if you want. Uh, it was a uh, relation to the uh, new inventions, uh, new revelations, but today this uh, physics uh, apparatus it becomes um, a thing apart from the reality, and it seems like a counter-revolution, vice versa revolution. But even so, 
Uh, this was the idea I was trying to uh, let everybody to understand by my presentation. And uh, I had a wonderful uh, sensation while participating in this Congress, listening to uh, different presentations, which we are dealing with things which I don't see in my day-to-day -day life, which I just don't read, don't listen, I don't see them. But if something happens in uh, my life, the evaluation of what uh, is happening, is an uh, uh, indirect one, and uh, I realized that I really liked what happened here, and after two days of Congress I came back to home, and the first wish I had was to reread the Little Prince book. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank very much the Good Institute and uh, also Oleg for inviting me. And having me here, that's, that's a really wonderful occasion. And I agree to Sergey uh, that it's uh, totally interesting to get a glimpse into other disciplines, which sometimes is uh, very difficult in everyday life to, to get. Um, my presentation kind of refers to uh, Sergey in that sense that also the urban planning is in a kind of a crisis, you could say. Um, and I showed some representations now uh, that you get in the last couple of years, um, representations of research that is done on the city. Uh, you could say that uh, the invention of the city as a planable a unit was an invention of the 20th century, uh, with you, what you know, Le Corbusier and um, Cornelius van Eesteren, um, uh, Gropius, all these uh, architects that came and said, okay, we have a certain way of representing the city, showing it, and uh, planning it. Uh, this was then connected to a thought to know what a city is and uh, to project this thought on, uh, on a unit that should be homogeneous and it was a homogeneous space. At the same time, probably in the physics, uh, space was exploding, but for the architects, not at all. Uh, it still stayed homogenism. Now you can see that uh, lately there has been a shift, and this shift uh, towards a, a heterogeneous space is a big problem for the architects. Probably in sociology, uh, it had been a long time ago that the sociologists went into the field, for example, and do field work in the city. But at the same time, the sociologists, for example, of the Chicago School, still thought okay, we have to find out what is happening in the city, we have to be there ourselves and expose ourselves to the space, but at the same time they thought what the social is happening in a homogeneous unit. Uh, so it was very differentiated from what happened in, in architecture. You could see that uh, architecture is taking up this uh, field work just lately. It's completely new. In that sense you could say that uh, the city as a heterogeneous space, or a space where you have to be there yourself and not in a studio, but uh, to research in the field, is uh, like a dark side of the moon for the architects uh, at the moment. Although they live in the city all the time, and uh, uh, as Justin said, we don't have to make it complicated. But uh, for the architects now, it's, it's very complicated for the planners, because they don't know how to show what is happening. Although at the same time, they are planning all these big buildings that now uh, work as an image for cities. When you have a new engineering thing in Moscow or in St. Petersburg for these big companies, uh, you have the same in Hamburg with the Elbphilharmonie, uh, what you call city branding. So the architects are very, very active in uh, representing the city in a completely different way than the research is happening at the same time. Um, in that sense, uh, I wanted to show this kind of complication and this uh, movement of architecture uh, that is happening at the moment. At the same time, it has a kind of a political uh, connotation because, uh, uh, Sergei, you are talking about multitudes of particles. Uh, Helen was talking about multitude of <laughs> actors. And the same is happening then for architecture. You have a multitude uh, of performances, of actions <laughs> happening as city. And Raisa was showing um, that there's a reconquering of the city as a political act 
uh, at a target place, um, at, at a certain uh, cities that or Maidan, where the city is reconquered for a certain political stance of which we don't know yet what kind of political stance it is, but we know that it's happening in space or as space, but at the same time we can see when you show your presentation that you have no contact with an architect at all. So you see that uh, although sociology, politicology and the physicists are all uh, ahead, ahead of the architects a long time, we have no clue about the city because the architects have no contact to you <laughs> and vice versa. So you don't have the means to show where you live and how you live uh, because you have no the representational means of architecture. In that sense, the future probably, whatever future means, um, could be in that fact that these representations kind of uh, come together and um, change our image of the city as a political multitude or unit. Ale Karanson. <coughs> Ole Karanson, please. Um, my name is Ole Karanson. I'm the, from the uh, Philosophy Institute. Um, in uh, my presentation, I try to answer the question of uh, how do we see future, or how do we talk about future, and to see whether we have a chance to see some uh, pronunciations of future and what is it. I have tried to show it uh, using two modes of time, which uh, two modes of, uh, there, is more, there, there are more modes of uh, time existence, but I've tried to find some limit modes. One was uh, the time seen as a, a technique of uh, uh, quant quantity of modification or so-called technological time uh, as we usually see uh, time and understand it and also uh, a time which can be called uh, conditionally like a time law, time of long periods uh, where the future and the past are connected to the present and all the things we have uh, are or a vague memory of a myth or uh, an expecting of a messiah or of uh, apocalypse. It's a time of coming back. And I tried to uh, put some very simple and clear examples. I took two uh, pictures and I, sh uh, I showed how uh, those two uh, in 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 interpretations of time uh, are uh, present in our time, uh, showing uh, pictures of Kubrick uh, and Poirot. Uh, space system and uh, gravitation and I show how they interact and how they uh, help to uh, demonstrate one another and uh, the conclusions I came to uh, were that uh, any idea of future that we have is pre-programmed by the uh, conditions of existence uh, in uh, presence uh, by some so-called political uh, condition no, it doesn't matter whether uh, it is an ideological policy or a policy of uh, values which are shared by our society is not a direct policy. Uh, in any way, future, uh, we have it not as uh, something that we can represent. Uh, when uh, anybody tried to uh, show us future, to predict future, to elaborate a kind of futur futurology, uh, it's uh, like a policy which tries to uh, govern the future and the uh, movies uh, are interested because they show that this uh, politized or uh, ideologic future is uh, inconsistent because when we uh, see the history of development of uh, cinematography uh, it's uh, just amazing how uh, all the predictions of future are false uh, because sometimes the, uh, those who work with uh, pictures, they try to predict futures, but after two years we see that future is completely different. 
And uh, in this uh, sense, pictures are our world of senses, which lives in present and is trying to resist the scientific and the uh, political uh, images of future, which are given to us by certain uh, discourses and debates. And Thank now you. I would like to give the word to Hannah Prinsler. Thank you. So my contribution to um, the conference focused on the patent system and the implications and challenges challenges and tasks for the future. Um, I actually made the film about the patent system because I realized that it's not only the technologies itself, like robotization or nanotechnology, it's also what we should worry about is the fact who owns these technologies and you own technologies through a patent. And in my presentation I try to show that um, patents are not a natural right, but a social institution that Western civilizations at some point in their history established as a tool, as a teaching mechanism or a tool to actually encourage innovation and to inspire um, inventors to um, share their knowledge. But what we, we are seeing today is that um, in many cases this doesn't happen anymore. So um, it happens the opposite. I mean, patents are used actually to stifle innovation. They are used to, um, they're abused to control markets and monopolies. And um, they're also used or abused to capitalize natural resources, like genes, for example, or um, you have patents on animals, like gen genetically modified animals, which are very, like, of course, have very bioethical um, implications and questions that they raise. Um, also, the patent system is used to um, intensify or cement um, global injustices, if you think of Medis m medications, medicines, or for example, seeds, or um, environmental technologies that get hard to access for people in developing countries, for example. And the patent system actually makes access a saleable commo commodity, an economic commodity. So if you if we see all of that, I think it's time to actually question if this really justifies a monopoly that, I mean, was initially an idea that we as a society would give to an inventor to encourage innovations for our society, I mean, necessary innovations. And I think, yes, I mean, my personal answer is that um, it's probably not justified anymore. So I think if we look at the future, um, I think there's a future that we face, and this is the, a future that's probably uh, um, that, yeah, I mean, I feel anxious about because it's a future where companies keep on patenting more and more and securing more and more monopolies and where patent numbers in worldwide break the record every year and where a lot of patents make it even harder for people who want to invent things not to kind of infringe other patents. So it gets very harder all the time to be in inventive. And at the same time, you, ha you have companies that are always more aggressive in enforcing their intellectual property rights and their patents and to sue others. So I think that's the future that we're facing. And if we talk about the future that we wish to have, and that's something that we've been discussing here, I think it's a future where we say, OK, we, we, we wish to have a future where of global change, of equal chances. And so um, I think we can't expect huge companies and their research uh, and development uh, departments or planners to have the answers for all the like, necessary um, solutions that are um, needed in the world, if you think of water or if you think of um, access to energy or access to medicine, so especially in developing countries. So I think that the patent system is a tool to, I mean, is in the way to, um, or we have to think about how can we inspire these socially desirable innovations and um, is the patent system still the right tool to inspire these in innovations and what kind of mechanisms sh should we as a society kind of um, invent and uh, support? So, yeah, that was kind of my um, conclusion. Yeah, and I actually made a film about the uh, the patent system, so and it will come out later this year. So and will be broadcast in Germany and France, and maybe later um, 
I mean, maybe we get invited at some point to Moscow, and then you will have a chance to see the film. Thank you. We hope to see this picture too here this year uh, with the Hanna presentation and at the first day of Congress and the second day started with a presentation made by Sophie Schoenborn. Sophie, please. Um, yeah, I'm Sophia Schimborn. Uh, I'm an eco-sociologist from the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities, and I don't so I don't have this technological thinking of future. And um, but if we look into the future and dis discuss it here, it seems most of the time that it's more uh, determined by technologies. It's more like Lem's uh, omnipotence. And uh, also many of the future plans and politics uh, which try to handle uh, this complex future problem, uh, climate change, are also dominated by technical evolution processes or the belief in this one technique that will perhaps liberate us from all our uh, problem. Um, that's some kind of the dark side of the moon either, perhaps. <laughs> and, um, but social change, uh, I think, is already uh, happening now. And we saw it and discussed it uh, yesterday um, on the social movements. They are really loud. It's a loud social change uh, that is happening. But there are also small, uh, small initiatives and small scale uh, perspective I'd like to um, put into our discussion here. And um, that's why I'm some kind of uh, pleading for uh, grassroots innovations. Um, they don't uh, have to be successful, uh, we discussed it yesterday, um, or become professionalized, but they are interesting for us um, because they um, are embedded in a concrete context and they are uh, future thinking already put into practice. Um, and they are seeking for new concepts of societies and uh, perhaps a more sustainable society with uh, um, intergener addressing intergenerational uh, justice. And um, they offer um, a chance for us to break through this assumed determinated technical pathways. Um, so I think um, they are already put into practice. This is really um, um, interesting, I think. And um, they are small, um, perhaps like you can see them uh, in the city, um, reusing the city, for example. But they are many. And we have to um, look on those futures. And uh, I would say that we have to put them together and institutionalize it. Uh, in participation as a some kind of deliberative force power to the separation of powers. And uh, perhaps um, you have heard of some kind of future chambers and you can also install them on a local level or even up to the international levels. And so they have a chance to apply their future thinking uh, and even utopias uh, to the political agenda. Um, future perspective or at least they can try to discuss it uh, and discuss options and alternatives um, reaching beyond those small periods uh, of elections like also four years or some some years they can really go far into the future and discuss it and can even translate it to back to their national context uh, or to their national um, media landscape and yeah and that's why I'm pleading for it. It's more like they can put a um, creative narrative to this uh, natural, scientific, uh, dominated climate change scenario. Yeah, thank you. Raisa Barar. Wow. It's a bit hard to change. Now, the problem starts with how I should uh, describe myself. I should either call myself a sociologist, as Oleg and Wolf introduced me, or maybe I should express my um, political views, which are sometimes liberal, sometimes uh, left-sided, or I might call myself a member of the Futurological Congress. And in my presentation, I try to tackle the program of the correct and precise protest description. If it's possible for us to characterize protests uh, which um, came across Middle East, uh, Europe, uh, Wall Street, Moscow, and Kiev, 
if we can offer a uniform framework, if it's possible to disenchant uh, protests using Weber's uh, categories uh, of disenchanting to uh, protest movement, and if it's possible for us to identify any uniform framework of uh, protest. To me, it's possible to disenchant protests, but it's not quite correct uh, regarding to what we see today. If we try to describe a protest today uh, in terms of empirical sociology, in case of Moscow we see a creative class, uh, young and educating uh, person, student or, or graduate, but however, uh, the attempts to describe him would be Fruit, fruitless, uh, because after it's a person mm, who started protesting in December 2011, then Bolotne events were came in 2012. Uh, he continued protesting in 2013. He's a highly educated Moscovite. Uh, however, that doesn't explain uh, what uh, really made uh, people to protest. It's critical critical to remember that uh, Peter Rotters Dyke. Um, uh, sociologists said that any protest tries to uh, ruin the foundation of the uh, existing system. So the protest, uh, uh, so and we should avoid trying to embed protest in some stereotype uh, context. Uh, if we Take a look at uh, protests of Middle East, Europe, and Wall Street. These are attempts to describe a communicating person. And Alan Terrain, in back in the 80s, uh, wrote that he was waiting for an acting man. So uh, our conclusion should be that the acting, acting and communicating person is back. And in my yesterday's presentation, I was trying to focus in a detail for on reasons for um, Arab Spring. I described the situation when Mohammed uh, Benazizi, uh, a street merchant, uh, burned himself, set himself on fire in Tunisia, and there was some economic context uh, behind the protest. But we should remember that Ben Ali, who was a long-standing leader of uh, uh, Tunisia stood in power and there were bans on communication, censorship, the same with Egypt. Uh, so Mubarak covered the entire political scope and uh, the young generation um, had no feeling of the possibility for social lifts. Uh, Spain also saw a wave of protests. So I um, gave the example of Puerta del Sol, a square in Madrid, uh, which saw protests. So they were young people unemployed and uh, a wave of unemployment followed and in Moscow uh, protesters were trying to tell the power, the government, we didn't even represent us. And I think in Moscow we saw the birth of a communicating person. So that was in line with the logics of breaking the rigid system, the closed system of uh, um, putting attempts uh, to restrict communications. And on the eve of our elections, we saw a ban when the other uh, Russia and other uh, opposition parties were n forbidden uh, to poll. And um, at the end of the day, we got uh, really the parliament which doesn't represent us. And in Ukrainians, Maidan, again, um, the protests were inspired by the desire of the protesters to get representation. So to me, that protest movement should not be described uh, from the point of view of behaviorism. When we study interests of a person uh, which is not uh, satisfied, so it's like in Russia, we can remember the protest against uh, uh, monetization of uh, benefits uh, when there was just one trigger and one response from the power. So, but a recent process uh, uh, just had no uh, clear 
uh, targets. So recently in Middle East and in Europe, uh, protesting people are trying to stop uh, the power from blocking communication. And Facebook and Twitter are just tools. And uh, the ways of just occupying Maidan or Tahrir or Sakharov Square or Puerto del Sol or Chistipuri, um, uh, those were just the attempts to declare uh, their words. So occupying urban space are common for the entire um, protest movement. The second uh, important feature is a particular uh, style of communication. So I mentioned Facebook and Twitter. So they became an alternative for a transparent, open way of uh, spreading information. So if we take a look at a uh, protest movement in Egypt, uh, in Tunisia, in New York, Wall Street in Moscow. So protesters create a shebalet, their own uh, language, their own argo, uh, words like with occupy or bolotna hashtag. So people create their own language and they hate uh, the language of motto, of slogan, and they create their communicate their own communicative space. The important trait was also bringing some iconic uh, characters into um, protest movement. So in Egypt, it was the case of uh, Mohammed Al Baradei, the former uh, IATA uh, chairman. So he was trying to say that uh, the local president. Uh, uh, has no authority anymore. Uh, and in Russia, there were uh, people like poet Dmitry Bikov or actress Lia Ahedjakova who were trying to um, convert their authority into a shape of communication. And uh, to summarize, it's uh, impossible to uh, build the protest into the logics of the protesters. So protest is a new way of communicating of uh, structuring social relations, a new way of, uh, inter of social interaction and mutual aid, and also confidence to each other. Many thanks. Uh, no doubt uh, this topic will continue during our discussion. Uh, so in my uh, scholarly work, I'm mostly a specialist in the history and philosophy of science from uh, late antiquity to the early modern period. Uh, more or less everything that happens after 1789, 1804 is a blur to me. Uh, I don't understand it. I think it's far less interesting than the past. Uh, and I'm certain also that there's something intrinsically irresponsible and also in need of interrogation about the very idea of speaking of the future. Why? Because it doesn't exist. There is no such thing. Uh, even for the past, there are serious skeptical boundaries to speaking as if we know what the past is, or even as if we know that the world was not created ex nihilo five minutes ago. If we want to overcome that skeptical argument or just not waste our time with it, there's still the problem of making certain claims with a rigorous scientific status about particular facts about the past. And yet, we do know that there are particular facts from the past, unlike the future. There are no particular facts about the future. So we ought to be really careful lest we slide into pure, irresponsible, anti-scientific speculation. And I think when someone like Stanislav Lem is writing about the concept of futurology, he's doing this in a kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, somewhat ironic, humorous, literary creative way, and that's wonderful. Um, but if we think we're doing something different, then we need to seriously address uh, the, the, the epistemological um, um, boundaries to what can be said. Now, of course, again, 
even if we want to talk talk about the present, Aristotle would say that uh, that, that that the present doesn't exist either because it's subject to Sorites paradoxes. So we can't really talk about the past, present, or the future, and there's nothing left to say. And again, no one wants to wants to be that rigorous. So again, all I'm all I'm doing is 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 requesting that we interrogate uh, uh, how to be rigorous about the future. My proposal, and the, the place I come into this as a historian of philosophy, is that something can be said, or a beginning of something can be said, about the future by taking a sort of long durée perspective on processes from the past. We know by looking at past projections of the future uh, that the future will not be simply a modification of the present. And uh, the wonderful American uh, philosopher of art, Arthur Danto, liked to talk about the Victorian lamps that you would see on fin du siècle uh, representations of future spaceships, right? And of course there are no Victorian lanterns on spaceships, but they had no other way to project it. And so looking at that example is a way of, uh, of, of, of reminding ourselves to be cautious about our own projections. Now, in my own case, I've been looking at the history of lunar astronomy, mostly from Plutarch through Kepler, and trying to show the way in which uh, what you could call the cultural history of the moon um, had a direct effect on the planning of, uh, of, of Soviet and American space programs at the moment when technology finally uh, congealed so as to facilitate these programs. And I think taking this very long durée perspective and um, and looking at technological developments as congealings of very deeply rooted, historically deeply rooted desires and cultural preoccupations uh, is probably the best bet for making futurology, if not rigorously, rigorously scientific, at least uh, not um, hot air. So that's my input, thanks. Thank you. Halil Unver. Thank you very much. Um, I talked about the eco-social market economy on a global manner. It's very, very hard to think about any global problematic. And in case uh, Wolf introduced me as an engineer, yes, it's a little bit difficult to solve en as an engineer problems of economical uh, problems if you are not able to think about economical problems and also I am an economist anyway to do to, to deal about this problem um, coming from Ulm about the future Ulm is a small town having the highest church on earth there and Albert Einstein was born there so I was I will begin with Albert Einstein he said I'll never think about the future because it comes early enough anyway but if you look to global population blow up with Sergei Kapitza so to the future protection uh, or to the projection of the data of population. And if you look backwards to the 1950, they predicted really, really good about 2% uh, variety of the population now. And we start all the time with the population. In 2020, it will be approximately, we calculate with 10 billion people all around the world. And most of them, 80% will be in developing countries. And we are, I think, everybody is here high developed anyway, because we will not be able to, about talking about the future, because if you are going to bed, get hungry. And what's a global eco-social market economy is anyway, to have a balance between the three pillars. The one is the economical side. Look, how is the income? How, many, how much do you earn? What is the economical process in a society? The other way is the ecological resources, energy, and all the parts. How are we able to build engineering with like the geology? And the third pillar is the social balance. Um, are we able to produce in an economical manner to enough, but because nobody will be anyway uh, uh, 
part of a, an, an, a decreasing economy. Everybody wants to grow. Are we able to distribute these growers in a balanced way? Not like the, all the Soviet Union, everything equal, and not like the US American capitalisms, because the income distribution is then too high. And if you are going to a mathematical point of an income distribution, we are able to analyze which countries are, have a best balance between receipt. Yeah, such as global problems, yeah? <laughs> because it's very, very hard, you know, um, to have a three-pillar balance way. You have to look at it at the same time, not solving, first of all, economical problems, afterwards solving social problems, and afterwards solving, anyway, uh, the other problems. You have to look at it in a directional and in a balanced way. And I get from Wolf the three questions. He asked me, do it with one question. I said, okay, you will get one A and one B. The one A was, is a global eco-social market economy imaginable? I think most of the people would say anyway, yeah, I can imagine a lot of things. <laughs> but the second thing, and that's the point why I'm as an engineer could have a problem-solving process on this problem in a global manner is, we have to anyway achieve it, to realize it. As an engineer, if you are going to make any think thinkings about any processors, but you are not able to introduce as an innovation, I have the great luck to work in a couple of companies like Google, Vodafone, um, also Ernst Young, PNB Paribas for the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And if you are not able to introduce this innovation into the market, you will never, never earn money and you will never um, real, get being realized. And what I want to say at uh, the last point is what could be the solution for having a global eco-social market economy? You look, we are looking having from from social point of view, from uh, anyway, uh, historical, from uh, cultural way, from ecological way, as we are trying to s think about the future from very, very much interdisciplinary approaches, we have to look about the global problems from an international perspective, international and intergenerational and also interdisciplinary. The last thing is, I would say, yes, it's imaginable and yes it's achievable but we have to develop a global empathy thank you yeah. Yeah. hello everybody um, also um, thank you for inviting me uh, just uh, let me quickly um, introduce myself and where I'm coming from I'm working for an organization in Germany and um, that was um, founded based on the analysis that Germany um, after the fall of the Berlin uh, wall is actually quite big and has a large impact on uh, poor people in developing countries. And that in the political process in Germany, there's no representation of such people and that people need to launch a lobby organizations while other political interests do have, do have their say in the political process. Um, so today we are covering um, several issues um, that have um, large impacts um, on developing countries and, and, and people in developing countries. And one of them is climate change. Um, Okay, um, I um, basically um, structured my input into the discussions uh, on, on three issues. I started off um, by showing some of the projections, not predictions, projections um, by um, scientists um, th that show um, global trends and global problems. And um, I picked out um, climate change as the um, central um, sustainability challenge because there if we um, project um, Business as usual, uh, we will see um, drastic changes uh, within the lifetimes of our generation and, and, and certainly the generation um, thereafter. Um, secondly, I also showed um, the kind of um, consequences that follow from that, uh, uh, from, from these trends, because first and foremost, they will affect uh, poor people, and that uh, is um, the starting point uh, for, my, for my organizations uh, to get involved. Um, and maybe um, and on, on this um, first part, um, the last bit I introduced was to also show that right now we are at a defining point because over the next 10 years we will actually add another billion people 
um, to um, the global middle class. So um, we basically have different trends coming together. Uh, and unless, uh, or unlike maybe 10 years before, we also um, see that some of those projections that have been made 20 years ago, for example, um, on agri agriculture commodity prices, are now um, getting in reality that actually, um, so, uh, that actually sh shows that um, supply is, uh, is not enough and doesn't meet the demand and that um, agriculture prices, for example, um, are getting up. Um, secondly, I introduced um, four scenarios of the future, of how we see um, the future developing, uh, if uh, different ways um, to different narratives, so to say. I think the first one is the uncontrolled, uncontrolled experiment um, with uh, planet Earth, which would mean uh, a complete terra incognita for humanity, because it would mean four degrees, uh, four degrees by the year uh, 2100, and no stabilization thereafter, and we don't, we actually don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but we can certainly um, say that it will impact on such things like weather extremes, um, agriculture production, large, large scale, uh, large shifts of ecosystem, and so on. Um, secondly, the second scenario um, I developed was um, the planet on life support, um, which is about uh, geoengineering, trying to actively fix the problem um, after the fact. Um, and there, there are two um, uh, fundamental ways to do that, trying on a, on a large scale to, to remove um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, also, or to alter our ecosystems um, to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or directly uh, trying to change um, the radiation um, system of the Earth, uh, which of course has uh, large side effects if you do it. Uh, and we don't, it's, it's a complex system. We don't know what's going to happen if we actually try to establish that. The third um, kind of scenario is, um, we call it climate apartheid, um, where actually um, those that have something are setting the pace on um, changing uh, to, uh, towards uh, some sort of a green economy, um, and that the global middle classes and upper classes, of course, as well, um, are actually betting on their ability um, to handle um, the future consequences of climate change. And um, fourth, um, what we say is um, uh, what we call um, climate cooperation or climate cooperation um, scenario is actually that we're getting, that we can collectively um, start um, to try to shift uh, the world economy to an equilibrium um, that, is, um, that, that doesn't have um, as much um, climate impact, so to say. Um, and there's a large dividend to that because, our ex for example, our existing energy system has large, also uh, big consequences uh, on, on, on things like democracy, um, on things like water access, etc. cetera. Um, then, um, I'll, then um, maybe just um, also summarizing the discussion that was prompted as a result of my, my input uh, was um, the what to do. Um, and I... Um, had my phrase uh, decrease the footprint, uh, increase uh, the handprint, um, showing that it's not only, that it's first a collective action that is necessary and an individual action, that there's a window of opportunity um, coming up um, also um, through the international system. For example, um, in the next two years, um, there will be the, the attempt internationally to create a climate agreement. The international community will also set um, the objectives for the next 15 years uh, where humanity should strive to and climate change and sustainability in general will be, will be on the national agenda in each and every country in the world uh, in, in, in this year and the, the coming year. Thanks a lot, um, David. Yeah. I have a feeling that everyone is eager to wrap up the introductory part and finally move on to the actual discussion. We all, as well, very uh, uninteresting to repeat ourselves, to repeat what we said yesterday. It is much more productive to discuss what was mentioned earlier today, specifically in the second part of the dispute. Here is the question I want to ask. What is out there that unites us? What presently can be served to us and uh, unifying force? Just by relying on what was said previously, uh, 
preliminary a, a preliminary assumption could be made. There is a lack of conceptual apparatus exists in interdisciplinary fields of study. At least soci sociology open accepts this notion philosophy and urban studies might as well face the same issues. Reality itself exceeds our ability to respond to it, our ability to understand and present it in every possible sense of the world. Simply put, we are unable to generate a framework of universal ideas which can be used in our professional activities. It seems to me that a spe specific quality of reality isn't excessiveness, so to speak, points towards something we don't know yet how to define. Something of the future kind. Unfortunately, there is a phrase in science fiction genre that can summarize the totality of the problem. The future is already here. In the situation like we have one today, I mean our Congress, we have a privilege to reconsider the meaning of the of words which we use some, somewhat irresponsibly in our everyday life. The future, what it is, really. Some philosophers, for example, would pick a word of an idea and he would operate with it, considering uh, that its meaning cannot be alerted. That was exactly what happened some time ago to our beloved Derrida. He invented that our understanding of the word future have a very specific meaning. It is the future of our prediction, instructions and codes. It is simply our projection of the present moment into the future. In this sense, our future can be easily productive. But if we don't even know how to determine whatever poses itself as a reality, then we are in trouble. That is why Dorida created something we might call a, a to, an alternative temporal scale, an alternative way to represent the future, and he calls his creation Levenir. To make it short, he ch suggested that future could not be determined or predicted at all, because it is unfolding itself at any given moment. What is so interesting to analyze what is uh, presently happening in Ukraine, not only because it correlates with our mutual moral sense, above all, it exactly the case of unfolding future, which is yet to be defined. Let me take for example a phenomena, a manifestation of common people on the square. There is not just another way to be involved in the, in the process of communication. There is a new way to do politics. Demonstrators don't want just to have the representative in the parliament. They want to do politics on their own. Some theoreticians, as Bridget Butler, are trying to comprehend this new notion. I, th I think that we are all witnessing the birth of new subject of person, of manifesting people. These manifestants are the case of the newly redefined urban space. This is the birth of new city, new subject, when we are multitude. The world multitude is the key word nowadays. This multitude which is this is the multitude which is not unity unity is the state and unity is the future and multitude opens the new dimension of time dimension of events and dimension of the future we cannot predict this changing but uh, it can find us but it can find us
Thank you. Uh, I'm a city blogger, and, uh, and it will be very, very short uh, because we have no time. Uh, my presentation was about cities uh, and a little bit about punk music, but uh, first of all, cities. And if I have some more time, I, uh, the main question was uh, what is it, uh, uh, why is it so difficult to uh, predict the future of cities nowadays? It was much more easy some decades ago in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, I think uh, because urban planners in the last century believe they can do anything, they don't care about uh, the environment, nor uh, economical, uh, neither uh, natural environment. They forget if there is no reason to be a city somewhere, uh, there is no reason uh, to be a city so big, uh, it won't be there or it won't be so big. But why is it so important now uh, when we are talking about future? because this is the future for some city in the world. Uh, for example, in China, where cities replay uh, the history of American cities and are very successful, but, uh, but they will uh, reach the corridors that when they have to fight the problems American cities uh, are fighting. Uh, on the other hand, some city will fall uh, because uh, they have, they we have no reason to be there. For example, there was a discussion about Dubai, uh, which has a reason to be there, but uh, uh, after 20 years, will it have reason to be there? And uh, at the end, uh, uh, the, the future of all cities in, in Europe or in, or in America, uh, we have no choice because of the last century's urban planner who decided our city's future. Uh, some decades ago, uh, we have to uh, use uh, everything again and thinking about the reusing, uh, watch some other uh, people mention. It seems that I am the only one here who will speak from a humanitarian or even artistic point of view of the future. Artistic thoughts is not a weak kind of thinking. It is just another way of thinking. And strangely enough, people of natural science usually understand this better. So, I proceed from the assumption that we all live in civilization that is now uh, experiencing the crisis of the future. And how it's commonly said nowadays, there are lots of death of are declared. Starting from the death of God and all the way through the death of Ote, of Noble and so on. We, uh, so we can speak of the death of the future. Uh, what I mean is not a chronological future and not even an unpredict unpredictable future. That is somewhere near, but the future as the substantial category, category which uh, creates the present and involves groups of people. The future as a value. Uh, that is the future artists usually speak about. It's commonly said that the artist lives in the future, that he is the guest and an alien in the present, and all his life is in the future. Future doesn't seem to be scared yet. If it would be scared, future doesn't seem to be scared yet. If it would be scared, all Russians, as Nikolai Gobel said, should become a lot like Alexander Pushkin in 200 years. But it isn't happening. So the disappearance of this is of this the very future everything is happening for, the future has surpassed the present and even Cities, the different 
semantic registers. Uh, the disappearance of the whole category of, on my point of view, can be explained by traumas of 20th century, invading of uh, future by utopian theories of totalitarian regimes where people were trying to create the future all by themselves. And this situation made people aware of thinking about the future. Lots of contemporary philosophers and thinkers still say, uh, still stay on this position. They are afraid of thinking about the future, about any positive project in the future. And lots of current artists and thinkers will have this fear that thoughts of future will lead back to totalitarianism. And this fear goes on for ages. At the same time, the humankind itself never in its history lived without the idea of overcoming that is linked to the future, the idea of overcoming the given. So, what can we do in a situation like this? In a civilization that thinks of itself as of civilization that exists after something, not before something, as it used to be for ages. Sometimes this after contains some tragedy and sometimes the feeling that all the greatness is in the past and modern men have no power to argue such a great power. In my speech I propose to imagine the main hazards of nowadays, not just the totalitarianism we always think about, uh, but the hazard of the present facing something. Uh, none thinks about because everybody thinks about something that is ending and very few thinks of what actually starts. So I made a conjecture about three wars that are overcoming by bravery. The war of death, the war of blame and the war of inanity. And every time the bravery fights these worries, I call the danger of the current the hazard of completeness. The danger that doesn't feel as a danger and even pacifies us and makes it impossible to think of anything else that doesn't sound uh, like a conflict, or at least the conflict is the way deeper. Yet it is a conflict, because stopping on some point is again the human nature. And persistence of uh, the other layer of reality that linked uh, to the future is necessary for the reality. And this is the very disgust of... And this, the very disgust of present, is caused by the fact that the magnet of the future doesn't work anymore. Um, thanks a lot, um, Olga. Thanks um, all um, uh, <coughs> all our um, participants. Um, before opening now the um, uh, the floor for questions from the public, um, I just um, from from on the side uh, from our side, I um, maybe just want to share with just really two ideas, which seem to be what common to almost all um, the participants. And maybe that's a question of. Um, the question of defending the future, defending the future against um, pre-definition, in a way. So while we all ask ourselves, in a way, is the future already predefined? Is it pre predefined by automization? Is it predefined by by whatever? Is it what is it um, international companies trying to predefine their um, territory already by uh, by virtue of um, using? Uh, patent, existing patent law. Um, so um, I think this is really a, um, a question we've been uh, that's been underlying uh, that is underlying um, all our um, various um, various talk, and it's a, it's a very interesting question to think about. 
I want the other um, uh, question that struck me personally is, um, and it's actually um, connected to that. Um, Justin was speaking about the dark side of the moon, well, and mankind projecting all um, all sorts of things onto the dark side of the moon. Uh, well, that there's some some weird animals living there, all kinds of weird things going on on the dark side of the moon, which then turned out to be absolute nonsense. Well, as soon as um, uh, uh, Soviet rocket um, uh, uh, <coughs> decided to check upon all of that and um, to find out that it uh, wasn't indeed the case. And well, that's, a, 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 that's another question for me. Um, in how far, um, what's the dark side of the moon that is um, being projected um, nowadays? What are our projections nowadays, which then in 50, down, 50 years down the road may turn out to be absolute and entire nonsense? And, um, and why do we use these, or why are these projections used, and what are um, these projections used for? Um, these are, I think, important questions. But anyway, now we've talked enough. Um, you, um, me, I, I hope you caught a glimpse of um, uh, what's been going on the last two days, and um, now I'd like to open uh, the space for the public. <coughs> There are only 30 to 40 minutes left. I ask you to name yourself briefly and distinctly. Andre, please. Thank you, Aleda. I have actually a comment on what Justin said. And... I want to comment on what was being said by Justin. And I also have a question for Christopher. Uh, if I understood you correctly, Justin, you meant that our discussion about the future is irrelevant because uh, there is no fact of the matter. It seems to me, and it was mentioned previously by Olga Alexandrova, that an important part of any discussion is a way of planning ahead or projecting. Uh, moreover, we can easily reverse the uh, argument and claim. It is irresponsible not to plan ahead. There are so many examples of uh, the destructive and irresponsible behavior in Russian history. In architecture, for example, there is a case of what happened to Cathedral of Church the Saver. It was demolished and swept with an open-air pool which in its turn was also demolished and gave way to new cathedral of church of Christ the Savior. Logically speaking, if we want to have a provide discussion that is a need to agree upon a certain type of uh, modality such as uh, such a type which will make the idea of projecting open and available. And also, here is a question for Christopher. In the regards of topic of hypothetical uh, declared opposition, which uh, taking part in the city's environment, why do you think a physical space uh, carries such an important role, even even though we have so many options of virtual communications, internet, Facebook, and so on? Yes, it's just an assumption that I have, and this assumption has to do with a technological uh, notion of architecture which is called scale. Uh, something that actually only happens to scale. The notion of scale itself, um, which is it's very important for architecture, but it's a social discourse, for example. It's not mentioned that much in scale. And uh, maybe uh, 
talk about agency and uh, a certain way of experience uh, a power in you yourself of, of, of how influential your action can be. I think the scale of the nation state, which is uh, since the 16th century, the, the scale of thinking politically uh, is so big that it's just uh, not uh, handle. Uh, you, you, you miss something with, with the scale, you cannot touch it. And then you had in the 60s, you had, uh, for example, conquering the, 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 the street. That was the 60s thing. And also then in the 70s and 80s, for example, in Germany, you had the building, conquering buildings. Uh, and um, nowadays what we see is a, is a change in scale. The change uh, is getting bigger, you, you, you could say. Uh, at least for what we can observe in Germany, that the citizens feel that the function of the city itself is in danger. The function of the city is not uh, safe, and uh, that's how they conquer uh, a certain square. But it's not the square alone, it's the projection of the whole city and redefining uh, what a city can be. So for me, it's just an assumption. My thesis would be that the city is now starting to become the scale of uh, political agency and redefining what it is in that way. Thank you. My colleague said that an occupying of an urban spaces is nothing, is nothing but a political action on on a bigger scale and I would like to involve on that. Political protest of the last few years follow the logics of situationalism, logic of student revolt in 60s and 70s, logic of Bolsheviks who occupied the Winter Palace. The political movement can be described in one statement. One who controls the territory is the one who controls the meaning. What is happening now? Zygmunt Bauman and Maurice Halbox are the great authors of this theory. Zygmunt Bauman stated in his book Individualized Society that occupying of an urban territory in a digital world is a new way to dialogue between common citizen and government, an attempt to d discover who represents government, who represents government, the police or authority representatives who will meet the protesters who occupy the space. The second logic is described in Halbach's theory. He points in his book Social Boundaries of Memory that a city is just a subject of the memory that collects certain contents of culture. City is an area of different epochs, so now city belongs to the epoch, epoch of protest. Facebook and Twitter are mobilizing means of evolution, not because it calls to go to barricades and to fight for freedom, but represents photos and certain visual senses. M many people go to rallies not because they share cer certain political activist slogans, but they form the mass that fills the space and the memory of territory remains in photos. So the main idea relates to filling the form with specific content. Alexander Anoski, Institute of Philosophy. I have a question to Yelena Petrovska and other participants, especially from Germany. They also know much about the practice of occupying urban spaces, especially universities in response to Bologna process. The question is, has the protest 
transformed from unpredictable future into the predictable one. Will the present be back? And do we have to live with it? And putting it more theoretical way, has the protest become new communication system like politics, economics, science, religion? Has the protest become new communicative system that we have to live with? I understand this question is addressed to many of us. Y yesterday we talked about it and tried to discuss it. What I try to say is following. Protest doesn't transform into politics. If we consider politics like old political model that Ashes from political theorists of 17th century. We all know it very well because it's the model of uh, seven year states. So the protest undermines the logic of uh, sovereignty in all senses of the world. That's why the protest can't be called uh, politics in old. Uh, Habitual sense of the word. Uh, can we call it a communicative system? Can we detect certain signals or impulses that we should react in a certain way in the protest protests? Is the protest new type of media communications like authority, money, and so on? No. Uh, no, I think. All that we call media communications is more connected with politics. So I consider protest like something uh, political that is not uh, appropriately by politics yet. It's being appropriated in every moment when the new slogans or self-declarated ideologies appear. All the invasions of politics, like institution in uh, protest that has no institutional dimensions. Uh, that's why theorists that are in general left, that are in general left seats, insist insist on the world multitude. There is ra radically another way to perceive action uh, comparing with old philosophical model. This model imposes the idea of whole unity and finally the whole process of conception creation. We all get used to the system of indirect conceptions, so the cognition process is organized in that way. That should be understood even mentally by passing all conceptual system that the habitual for philosophy. So the subject is conceptualized through action, it appears in the moment of action. There is no subject before action and there is no subject after action. So the action is the subject. If we were, if we'll think about subject and action like system of forces that interact and counteract with each other, it will be very difficult to apply old system of concepts, including political ones. Uh, this is something different. And how to speak about this? It's a question of theories. This is the model that uh, can the member of unity of any kind, conceptual unity, political unity. Model that keeps the quality, model that can be reduced to anything that we know. It's very complicated to apply conceptual system of multitude. I think protest challenges us. It's, 
very complicated to cope with conceptual ink or our new reality. Um, I think uh, concerning uh, the discipline of architecture and planning, the protests uh, have a big meaning because they are more about uh, making place than a container. Raisa said, okay, the city can be a container for protest, a, pr a square can be a container, uh, but this is more the model of a city that you had a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, like a bourgeois kind of thing, you have a, 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 a lot, a place that belongs to the city, and it's an open space, what we call maybe public sphere with Habermas or whatever, and you would go there and you could articulate a certain political stance. Nowadays, it's completely different because uh, it's completely pri privatized. You have all these shops, you have a certain um, kind of uh, accumulation of, of capital, you could say, uh, throughout the city as a space that is sold and resold and all that. In that sense, uh, the, the appropriation of the space and how you do it is a really an architectural question in a completely new sense. You can see it in the Gezi Park in, in Turkey, for example. Was it just an architectural project? Uh, and then it completely changed around and said, okay, we don't have to want to have this uh, architectural thing happening in this way, but we want to have it in another way. But at the same time, they created a certain way of producing space there, same you can see in Maidan, a certain way of uh, making place that is now becoming uh, essential for architecture as a production and not as a container. Uh, I would allow myself to contribute. So you are talking about a subject very important for psychoanalysts. Uh, multitude was not only Negris, but also Burns um, concept. And this is a very important subject on how we can describe the multitude. Multitude, of course, doesn't allow for a pluralism of opinion. And we need a new logic. So, I would like to give you one predicate we can find in Burns' uh, works. So it's not a predicate, but it's not a definition, but it's a reflection on the contemporary humor. So he talks about them in uh, architectural sense. So it's uh, the way where a person does be, doesn't feel at home feel home, being at home. So I don't know what that would mean for an architect, but it's rather like a Möbius strip. How can you build a home which would be in line with this logical concept, which would, by um, the opinion, in the opinion of many philosophers, uh, would set the mark. Um, so the multitude, as you correctly said, uh, we can see it uh, in the place where where there are some difficulties. I mentioned slip of the tongue, but excitingly, we can extend a little bit on this third and could add uh, a little bit of uh, definition. So uh, feeling, not feeling home at home, it's like a medium, mebu strip. So, and an act is like cutting Möbius strip making oriented surface non-oriented. This is more for topologists. Uh, and of course we aren't speaking about some known forms of uh, getting out to the streets which existed before, which uh, repeats some things that existed before. And we need to think about the way of thinking about the multitude without references to any transcendent, uh, transcendental things to a leader. And the psychoanalyst thinks about uh, it a lot. It's a multitude characterized by Lacan with the words not all. And it's multitude which Lacan uh, sees as a women's multitude and uh, for men he uh, sees a multitude based on transcendency. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Now uh, we will uh, have one more question, please. Uh, I would like to have a short question to have time for other kind of questions. Uh, good day to everybody. Uh, I think that uh, my, my name is Vyacheslav Vaikanarov. And uh, I uh, heard that nobody spoke about transhumanity. It's a magnet which we need. 
uh, this crisis of uh, sense, uh, this uh, lack of magnet. It, this magnet can be transhumanism, and uh, sometimes it's uh, subvalued. Uh, many people just don't think about it, and I would like to ask all the experts what do you think about transhumanism, or who is ready to answer. I would like to have your opinion. Uh, in context of future, uh, seen as a magnet of a new future. Uh, please, could, could, could you give more details, please? Uh, I can uh, say you uh, honestly that I don't know what is a transhumanism. Does anybody know about transhumanism? What is it? Uh, does anybody want to give an answer? Andrew, please, in brief, in brief. It, it was uh, the topic of our discussion and during the first uh, progress, uh, Congress. Uh, it's a perception of theory of evolution and uh, of uh, the further perspective of uh, human being development as a biological species. And uh, I think that it is a very important topic. And uh, by now, we just uh, don't have the full, complete understanding of Darwin. And the resources of 19th century in the humanitarian aspect, we just don't have the full understanding of it. It's my... It's Raisa supposes that uh, Constance can uh, answer this question. Constance, please. Well, I can't say anything about transhumanity, of course, because I'm, I'm a technologist. What is interesting to me is that um, there is, um, if I think back, uh, about the today's discussion and uh, the two days before, there's a certain notion that uh, technologists and uh, techniques as a whole are somewhat part of, of our future and the upcoming, um, but that the way we structure, build, design, manage and maintain them today doesn't have any effect uh, on the future because there's a certain feeling that uh, uh, whatever we think about the future, the way technology is designed and built, doesn't matter because we can change it. And I, I would like uh, to bring into the discussion that that is not the way it will work. And I give a drastic example, because it's the most drastic that I can think of, maybe. Um, let's think about um, autonomous drones or autonomous killer robots. That's a drastic example because it involves uh, there are many ethical questions in that. But let's think about the way it works today. We have nowadays prototypes of those machines. And we have a decade in which we look back on American practice that they use us, those autonomous drones and it really changed uh, the symmetry of, of power in the world. And now, maybe in 2015, maybe, 2016, there will be two or three other nations in the world, like India, maybe Russia, maybe China, that will have those machines. And the engineer that built that today and the program designers, they make decisions right now as we're speaking. And it will be a prof uh, there will be a profound uh, change in the upcoming. And I think it's, it's interesting that in the discussions we have those, uh, those the technologies we evolve today and that we can change only a little bit in the future or maybe restructure it in the future but not change as we at the way we build it today are not part of the discussion because everybody knows that we're going into a digitized technologized uh, future where we will depend on the technology in a level that we we, we should think of too but maybe just my point of view because I am a technologist. And <laughs> uh, please. My name is Igor Chubais. I'm a doctor of philosophy and I work uh, on uh, Russia. And uh, here a uh, lot of people speak about uh, Maidan. Uh, I just came back from there and I would like to uh, offer my solidarity to Maidan, to Ukrainian revolution. And I've got a question for a philosopher, for a socio sociologist. Uh, there were words the future is a projection of present. And
and uh, it's a very arguable for me because uh, sociology is the foundation of uh, its system of values and I believe the system of values that we have today uh, it's a dead end uh, system of values and uh, all these values the main values are freedom and money and freedom and money uh, it's a, a consumer society non limited consuming ecological crisis etc it's impossible and uh, absolute freedom it causes uh, the declaration of rights of uh, minorities. They have right to exist, but then they become a center. When we are uh, listening every day about uh, one uh, gender uh, marriage, it's an insanity. If we uh, defend only freedom, we will destroy the cultural tradition, national tradition, historical experience, and we will become uh, savages. So I think that future is not a process of uh, freedom and uh, consumism uh, and the basis I believe should be moral when we're speaking about God because we lost faith in God and I believe that's the way it will be a dead end and I would like to uh, hear your opinion please Oleg, Justin, Sasha, probably Olga when I hear the word moral I always uh, think because uh, what kind of moral do we know? Who uh, governs our moral? It's not something which is uh, given. It's something uh, political which uh, changes only uh, when there are some forces of future which uh, uh, eliminate this politicization. Elena spoke about it. Uh, there is uh, some action which is a result of future when it changes uh, the moral. So, meanwhile, we use moral like a condition of thinking about future. We have no future. We have a mean of uh, politic uh, to uh, grasp on the field of moral. Look uh, how uh, the political rhetoric is working, how is working the politic of uh, protest suppression. It always acts based on a very conservative uh, moral position, uh, using a moral which is based ontologically, and it's uh, an act of force uh, of the authorities. So when we're speaking about protests, for example, you say that uh, freedom and consumism. I don't know whether you, you why 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 are you using here uh, the uh, freedom and uh, consumism? I believe that freedom, it's a concept which uh, isn't uh, explained enough to uh, see it as a dangerous concept. And uh, I believe that dangerous concepts are democracy, and we know the uh, threats relation to democracy because uh, society politics, uh, they are trying to uh, enforce to society some framework, some limits, and the thought of uh, Spinoza about uh, the uh, multitude which was opposed to the idea of uh, state controlling the war of everybody against everybody it's uh, not, uh, uh, not 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 explained enough Justin please I agree completely with my colleague and I would like to say that in my opinion our debt as uh, scientists, as uh, researchers, is to is, is 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 not to defend this or that system of moral values, but to compare different uh, systems and to try to find their uh, strong and their weak points, their in insufficiencies, and to correct them. Alexander, please. Uh, the word moral, it's a good word. In psychoanalysis, there is a word super ego, and it's quite a complicated uh, problem. 
because super ego or moral, they uh, have a, um, various interests in uh, internal organization, which was discovered by Freud. Uh, the more you follow this uh, super ego, the stricter it is, and it's a paradox, and it uh, was a paradox which was the basis of uh, society, of society of guilt. And it's uh, quite a useful thing to organize social relationship based on uh, the feeling of guilt. And the psychoanalysis is trying to uh, uh, help to those who need it uh, to make the way from guilt to uh, wish. Uh, I've got a slip of the tongue. And uh, uh, the guilt. The guilt, or uh, is what is substituting the wish. I've got a slip of the tongue. I called in Russian uh, the word guilt is looks like the word wine. Uh, I would like to have wine now. And uh, there is a huge work to be done. And this work doesn't consist in make everything possible to permit everything. And there is uh, Lacan uh, says, uh, arguing with uh, Dostoevsky uh, in uh, uh, Karamazov Brothers, uh, one of uh, protagonists says that when there is no God, uh, no God, you can do anything. And Lacan says when there is no God, you can do nothing. But this uh, problem, moral problem, isn't a simple one. But we need to consider it and we need to think about how we can uh, make a shift from this uh, sense of uh, guilt, which is a paradoxical one, but efficient one to organize the relationship between uh, people to a society of other kind, to a society of wish, which in no case is a society where you can do anything you want. To. More questions, please. Ksenia uh, Golubovich, Logos Editorial. I listened to all the presenters and I tried to resume to uh, find some general links. Uh, I've got a formula, probably it's too generic, but uh, I think that it can uh, give the possibility to different people to answer my question. I believe that one part of studies uh, uh, is related to, the, to some powers which are occupying the possibilities of future, like patents, for example, and uh, which are some blocks on the way uh, of our society to future. And uh, when we started our conference, uh, we st uh, started with this uh, topic issue of uh, patents that uh, we, we said that uh, they were created for development, for communication, uh, for the knowledge to be continued, to not to be withheld. And uh, it transformed into completely another thing which is blocking now this possibility. And uh, Elena s uh, spoke also about politics, Alexa and so on, Olga Sedakova. In our present, there are two uh, trends. And the first one is uh, the trend of occupying, of present, of blocking the possibilities, uh, the possibilities of finding this new future. And uh, also some imperceptible. Uh, Olga uh, mentioned yesterday Pasternak, that, uh, who said that we uh, perceive the future when we notice our present, when uh, the present becomes something which is just the basis. Uh, it's the crisis of future. So I believe that the futurological crisis, uh, Congress is speaking uh, more about the present but not about the future and about the forces. Uh, and it, it was told by Christine. Uh, they were saying that this future, this automatized future, is something which is uh, uh, is being created now, and which is something which will be very difficult to uh, correct. And those blockages, uh, those automatizations, is uh, going from the present, and we are losing some moments in present. Uh, and the present results excessive, like says Elena, and it's something which you cannot uh, analyze. And I believe that Olga. Uh, the same thing, that the possibility of uh, present, uh, the possibility of see the present anxiety which is uh, running from us if we are not uh, attentive enough. So I would like uh, 
to come back to our present where we are now, where we are creating our future, and to speak about those imperceptible uh, things which uh, offer us new possibilities about future, which uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, the question for Olga, uh, which thing she sees as an artist, uh, as uh, things that pass by imperceptible, uh, and I think that uh, we also need to speak uh, about it with Sergei Krotov, who uh, spoke about new physics, uh, which, are, which are developed now. I think that to find those unseen things, those things that passed by, those things which are completely new, which uh, never existed before, uh, things that say that they were done, to they were gone, but uh, it's something very new. It's a uh, labor that is uh, an accidental labor. You cannot make any generic conclusions here. Uh, it's some of properties of the present. We are speaking about things which are seen as the uh, universals, but they are not. Uh, it's a relationship between the big and the small, the uh, particular, particular things and the general things. They are very different today from those that we've had in uh, mechani mechanistic uh, times. Uh, sometimes small things can be more valuable than the big ones. Uh, imperceptible things can be more important than the ones which are covered by all the media. And um, we are talking about superficial modernity and um, profound modernity. And the profound modernity is the part where we feel something which wasn't felt before. And I think that in uh, some way it's a response to um, the aggression of our civilization, aggression, uh, audible and visual, uh, visual aggression. And uh, we are trying not to uh, see some things and uh, to resolve it. Uh, we need, we need to see those unpercept un unperceptible things. And uh, I think that uh, when we need to discover the presence, we always experiment the risk of uh, personal failure. And uh, to see something real in the present, uh, you need to uh, be ready to uh, have this failure. I would like to say also that uh, I thought about it, I wanted to in include it in my presentation because they are of great importance for me, but uh, and now, and now having this question, I have the possibility to answer you. And I think that we are at the li uh, limit of a complete transformation revolution uh, in the structure of uh, education. Uh, the approach is the paradi paradigm of uh, how we are to educate to uh, our, our next generation. There will be uh, some um, crucial changes, some revolutionary changes, and I would like to, I would like you to see some uh, very important uh, observations that any revolutions in natural sciences was preceded by a revolution in, associ in associative perception of uh, reality. And there are some uh, very profound, serious uh, works about the relationship between the science and the art. And I believe that the uh, Intel intellect of the future uh, needs some uh, a synthetic uh, perception of reality when uh, a perception which is not uh, neither humanistic or technical one, but a perception of a person which is uh, educated uh, with a humanistic approach. But I believe that it doesn't exist by now, but uh, there were some uh, indication of that. We've had uh, several conferences uh, on the change of millennium between people who uh, works on education. Uh, who focused on shaping the new mindset and thinking for the future. And as I see it, we need some very smart synthesis between the two types of the knowledge. Thank you. Well, another question, please, to 
questions from the floor, then we will have to end, uh, sadly. Ksenia, thank you very much for a wonderful question. So, what we discussed here uh, was very much like uh, the patented seals scientists like to tell about the Tati patent cell. Um, so the stem cells, uh, which in future can produce uh, all types of uh, organs. So at laboratory trials stage, we don't know what the cell will finally uh, turn into. But uh, however, we c well, I would like to focus uh, Agagian's uh, work, Homo Sacker, uh, what was left after Auschwitz. Um, so he says uh, that uh, the uh, a per you know, a permanent conversation could uh, be um, the speaker, but also the person with experience who under underwent and realized so and I would like I to share the standpoint of the person who uh, was witnesses to some um, horrible events so and I would like to go deeper into the future because the projection depends uh, on the angle we look uh, from so if we would consider protest as a shape as a form of uh, self-organization um, if we ignore the mutual aid people offer to each other, so we can ignore the logics of the process. So to me, it's highly important to search for our own opinion towards future. Uh, sorry, uh, just only opinion from some other panelists. Uh, thank you, please. Uh, Again, is also. I think there seems to be uh, almost a positivistic nature uh, notion um, of that it's a wrong thing to predict the future. Um, it's you exactly, <laughs> kind of. Um, but I think it's also a willful political act to not project the future. Um, and of course, it's always a statement, a normative statement, to project the future, and we should be aware of that. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to highlight it this, um, that this is important to, um, to us. And uh, that's also why I introduced myself, not as a scientist, but as an organization that has a basis of trying to defend the interests of uh, the poor people, um, showing where I'm coming from. But I'm saying it's, it's a political act. And I actually see this tendency um, that um, um, on, on, on climate science right now, there's the biggest um, kind of process worldwide of trying to um, summarize and gather um, scientific information on climate change called the IPCC. And um, they, over the years, took a much more positivistic stance. Um, and what we see then in the end, in the political kind of discussions, is get uh, marginalized because uh, it's not going to work this way. Thank you. That's a very interesting comment. I acknowledge I am a sort of moderate neo-positivist. Uh, but I would never want that to uh, uh, translate into complicity uh, in a political stance against uh, 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 work towards a better future. On the contrary, I would want it to, uh, to, to motivate people to come up with more rigorous bases for projections of the future. Um, but I agree we need to make a very clear distinction between the two. Yeah. Yeah, looking about the future, um, I would say it's also what you said, uh, the bigger problem is the moral or the global empathy. And do you think moral is per definition international or do we have to establish an international moral? The first and the second is uh, if you are going to produce a future um, based on our analysis, it would be anyway, um, as I mentioned from these three pillars, the economical, the social and ecological pillar, if you are not able to recover, technologically we will be. But I think um, Zorkin could very, very explain it as good how difficult is it 
to make a process with 5,000 people making an agreement. If you are not able to recover these ecological problems, we will have a collapse. Second, if you are not able to have enough economical power, we will have the difference between developing and developed countries, and this will be going to the third pillar, the social, we will not be able to produce a social balance. And based on our way of calculations, 50% is a high percentage. It will be the way it's going on now. Yeah, we will see the, the protests. We will anyway, anyway going to 10 billion people. But if we are able to think about how is it a global empathy possible, and if we are trying to realize it, it could be that in 40, 50 years, that the population will be having any stabilization path. And if we have stabilized the, uh, the, the population, and if we have also stabilized the economical growth, I think the innovation processes will also be going slow down. And this could be that we have all these stresses now for having a better future. Just a very short uh, thing about uh, the future of, of ecological things. Uh, we're talking about uh, green design, green architecture, green uh, way of, uh, of planning fact green factories. But uh, which is greener? Which is greener? If I buy a new uh, shirt, which is very bio, very eco, even buttons are bio, super, or I don't buy a new shirt, just use the old one. I think the second is, is more greener. And uh, that should be in the city or anywhere, um, be the way of thinking, I think. Alexander. Christopher, no? Wow, just a couple of comments. Yeah, I would like to highlight a very interesting coincidence that many of our colleagues cover, many of our foreign guests cover environment, and most co colleagues are more focused on process. I don't know what the correlation is, but we see the two main problems, environment and uh, protest, because uh, both are focused on body, and the, our Earth is a body which supports some discourses and uh, which, uh, well, uh, propel, give rise to protests. Uh, sadly, we are really out of time and out of space. Two of our members, uh, Christopher and Justin, have to leave for Sheremetyevo Airport in two minutes, but uh, the things are we came through in the first two days and today will be made public through video and publishing uh, materials of our Congress in fa and Facebook and the contact groups are open for questions which were not asked.